It kind of boils down to three fundamental habits. Um, I describe them as preparation, presentation, and persistence. Um, you need to prepare, and I think this is actually where you guys have the advantage as journalism organizations, um, because you have you know, phenomenal kind of research um, and data analysis skills. So you have the capabilities to really understand who somebody, who a, what a potential donor might be looking for and how your organization or your project might be a fit for them. Um, so I would just encourage you to be creative in thinking about looking at you know, fundraising databases, news clips, to learn about the potential donors for your organizations and figure out what your, what your angle into them might be. Um, the second step, presentation, is a little bit harder. This is, this is the stage where you reach out to them and make your case for support. Um, who are we? What do we do? Why is it important? And why should you as a donor care? Those are sort of the three or four questions that you have to answer in your case for support in order to make a really compelling but succinct approach to a donor. Um, and if you can do that, you're well on the road to building a successful major gifts program because every conversation with a donor really needs to be about that donor. It's not about you, it's about them, what their agenda and objectives are, and how you can help them advance that agenda. And the last step is persistence. And this is actually the most important habit that I would encourage you to develop as, um, as managers or you know, as, as fundraisers. Um, because again, what a healthy donor program entails is relationships, really strong relationships, and that just takes time and patience um, and good manners and tact and all of that to cultivate. So it's a fairly simple process, but it means you have to put real time and thought and effort into uh, kind of customer service for your donors and your prospective donors. Thinking about what they need, what might interest them, what happened in your organization this week um, that is worth sending an email or making a phone call and giving them a quick update on. Um, so if you can kind of master those three habits and build it sometime in every day to work on those three things, uh, that's sort of the step to building a robust major donor pipeline and converting those prospects into supporters who will keep your organization healthy, keep the lights on for a long time. Um, <coughs> good morning. Good morning. I'm Wena Sungura. Um, I'm coming from Tanzania. I'm leading the Tanzania Media Foundation. This is a foundation which stands for strong and independent media sector in Tanzania. And the foundation actually emerged from a project of donors in 2008. By 2015, 2015, uh, it turned into an organization. So we have transitioned from a project based to an organization. And we're also moving forward to transition towards sustainability because we cannot be talking about uh, the media sustainability without taking into consideration our own sustainability. The TMF, uh, I mean, this is the abbreviation for Tanzania Media Foundation. In most cases, you can hear me saying TMF. This is the abbreviation of the Tanzania Media Foundation. It envisions the strong media sector in the country. And we do that through um, uh, grant giving and learning. And we also uh, focus on, um, on uh, uh, promotion, promotion of the investigative journalism and public interest journalism. And we bridge the gap between the rural reporting and the rural and urban reporting so that we can see more of uh, accountability happening and covering stories that matter to the ordinary people instead of covering stories that uh, matter to prominent people. We have experience on... Um, fundraising from the different donors, but uh, we are playing a role of the intermediary role where on one side you have the individual journalists and the media houses. So we normally raise the funds and support them, give them grants with a strong mentorship so that they can pursue stories of national interest and also investigative journalism. So we have three outcomes. The first outcome uh, that is expected to happen is quality, quantity, and diversity of investigative journalism and public interest journalism. And the second outcome that is expected to happen in the country is transform the media and improve the professional capacity uh, for the individual journalists so that you can see them doing a more responsible journalism. And the last outcome is about uh, uh, sustainability of our, our organization. So what I hope through this uh, panel and exchange of views is to see that um, 
uh, as we talk about the funding investigations, some of us, we have faced some risks on funding investigations. So you can ask for funds, but you also need to know where are you getting these funds and uh, who or political interests and how can they affect you so i hope after the q and a you may get to know this kind of risk that uh, you as an individual or media house if you are funded for your investigations what are the risks that can emerge because some of us we 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 we, we were interrogated by the police just because we were funding a particular investigative story so these are some of the risks and these are some of the expectations you being the participant, you might uh, uh, get to know at the end of this kind of uh, exchange. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brigitte Alfter. I'm the managing editor of journalismfund.eu. Uh, similar to Ernest's organizations, we are uh, organization, we are an intermediary. So I go fundraising with big donors, and I will not go into detail there because Bridget is much more specialized than that. Uh, and then we re-grant money to journalists who have a work plan and then who work on a given story. Um, on the fundraising, I just want to mention that uh, we do fundraising and some of the points that you mentioned, Bridget, were, were really, they reverberate, I, I recognize that very clearly from my work. I've been with Journalism Fund for 10 years now. Um, so the, the, the building of, of contacts and, and, and trust and so on with donors so that they know what we do and so on is, 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 is clear, clearly important. Uh, one thing which comes a bit to what Ernest said is we have turned down money from some donors. So we don't take any money. The, what, what is really fascinating in this group is that even we come from very different parts of the world, different continents, the questions are so similar. So let me explain a little bit about what we do at Journalism Fund. Uh, we want to function as the arm's length, or call it the firewall, or call it the buffer, uh, between the donors and the journalists. And this is for security reasons to a certain extent, but more importantly even, or in Europe, we, the security reasons are, are not so dominant in most countries, but the credibility is totally paramount. So if we can function as the arm's length and have a credible model where we can tell people, okay, the donors cannot interfere and the applicants and cannot interfere. The donor cannot get an influence on who gets the money and the applicant cannot say, oh, you know, you're my cousin, don't you send a little bit of money? Um, classically called nepotism. So we have, we use a peer review jury. We have four senior journalists or media lawyers or, or people from the, from the field uh, who are our peer review jury. They are anonymous as long as they work. And once they step out, their name is made public and you see, whoa, this is a high level investigative editor at the Guardian, for example, or something. And then we hope that you assume the rest of the peer reviewers will be equally high level. We pick them from all over Europe because we are a European and Europe is not a homogeneous place. Uh, we try to have different competencies aboard. But as long as the peer review jury is anon anonymous, you have the credibility vis-a-vis -vis the donors. And Journalism Fund has a Flemish branch where we take government money from Flanders and a European branch where we use predominantly uh, foundation money, but the, the applicants cannot approach them either. So if, because I have a huge network, we also organize a European Investigative Journal Conference, I know everybody. So there could be the suspicion that, oh, Brigitte gives money to her old colleagues from Denmark or something. No, they can't because it's the jury who decides. And the jury are so high level, they have a good name to lose. So if there was any nepotism there, or any influencing, they would have a good land to lose. So this is, we try to build models where there is a logic that safeguards the credibility. And this is one of them. Great, thank you. Um, so let, let me just start with kind of a round table, you know, whoever wants to answer, and then we'll, we'll sort of get into more of the discussion. But I guess just a really simple question. When, when donors go out, and I know not everybody here is a donor, but none of us are really a donor, but, but what do you think donors
then if, if you want to sort of roll on a little bit from that into uh, sort of the, the slightly more complex topic of uh, are they looking for particular types of coverage beyond different types of people or different types of organizations? Anybody? Yeah, yeah maybe I can start on, on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the Tanzania Media Foundation emerged from a project, and it was actually called Tanzania Media Fund, as a project of, of donors before it transitioned to an organization. So they had their own interest. But uh, uh, of course, just to mention, their interest was uh, grounded on good governance, transparency, and accountability. But on the other side, uh, the media side, and the investigative journalists in, in my country, um, they also had their own interests or need uh, to cover more investigative stories. So this was now how to, 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 to find the uh, communities and the, the, uh, the veterans in those years, I think since 2004, 2006, they started to, I mean, to fundraise, they like to make a case to donors. And uh, donors, they also accepted their case that, okay, we can support investigative journalism as long as they are also able to achieve what they, uh, they intend to achieve, which is all about good governance, transparency, and accountability. So just to respond on that quickly, that was one of the main interests of donors who, who actually agreed to contribute more than $7.1 million initially in 2008 for establishment of, the, of a fund. So, so that was their interest. Sure, I would say, you know, in general, if you're tar sort of looking at the, you know, what I'll call the usual suspects universe of donors, um, many of which, you know, support this conference, um, what they're interested in in sort of a big picture way is healthy democracy, right? Civic participation, information access, transparency. Um, so those are the sorts of you know, values you want to think about in terms of framing your case for support, your value proposition, and approaching donors like that. But that's sort of the, I think, this kind of philosophical view of uh, foundations and philanthropists that are supporting this kind of work. In terms of the particulars of what they might look for in an organization or a project, um, I think it's it's what any of us, you know, if, if you're regranting to freelancers or individuals, you know, it's, it's the same thing you'd wanna you'd wanna see, um, and the same thing you'd wanna see from your staff or your colleagues. Is there a work plan? Is there a timeline? Do we know what the deliverables will look like um, at a higher level? If you're talking about maybe a core support or a capacity building grant, um, what's you know what's the mission of the organization? What kind of impact have you had? Right. It's one thing to put out um, a tremendous investigation or to put on a conference like this, but what happens after we leave Johannesburg, right? You know, at, at GIJN, if we want to be successful in continuing our relationships with those donors, what we're going to have to prove to them is that, one, you know, we, we track what you guys do once you leave here and figure out what, the, what impact this actually has in the real world. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the mission and the vision of the organization and its leadership is also really important. Um, at the end of the day, uh, someone who's making a significant investment is usually investing in you and your capabilities as a leader um, and you know, their, their trust and their faith in you. Um, so establishing your own credentials and being able to point to the organizational impact that you've had and how you see yourself kind of making an impact in the future, your vision for what changes as a result of the existence of your organization is really paramount. I would... I would uh completely endorse what you said there, and I will then focus on the individual journalists applying for grants. Um, I think it's really important, or I have, let me take an example of a team that we supported. There were a team of, of seven young journalists uh, who were really appalled by the news coverage of the migration across the Mediterranean, because the news coverage was like, okay, 20 people drowned, 100 people drowned, so and so many dead, blah, blah, blah. And they were not able to, f they wanted to dive into the field and do it thoroughly, so they looked for figures before the application. Um, and they couldn't find the figures, so the project actually turned into a research in wh wh how do you account for people dying on their way to the European Union. And I talked with them after, they were very successful, they documented that the authorities didn't have good figures, they had quotes from, from author authorities who said, well, these people are dead, they're not migrating anymore, so we don't count them. Um, <laughs> and, um, 
and then they they published them in in each their country. When they started, when they applied for the grant, there were a team of seven. I think when they published, there were 13 or 14. Um, so it was a and it was quoted widely. Uh, they won the European Press Prize, so it was everything was successful. But the starting point was that they said, "Oops, there is a deadline with journalism fund. Let's sit down and do a work plan." And we need to do a work plan anyway if we want to get this off the ground. So they sat down and carefully crafted a work plan because that's what we ask our, our applicants. You know, who's on the team? Why is the com team composed with these um, countries and, and, and competencies? What's your work plan? Um, and so they sat down and did the work plan and applied. And yes, they got the money, but they said to me afterwards, if we hadn't gotten the money, the deadline as was set by Journalism Fund and for the questions we asked forced them to Cre write up a work plan. So what I tell when I, when I teach uh, journalism students about pitching applications is sit down and make a work plan. It's a good investment in your story anyway. So let me, one of you mentioned impact, well, Bridget, you mentioned impact. And impact can be something that's very difficult to show. So to some extent, what, what, what do you do, I guess, if your story doesn't have impact? You do a great investigation, no one goes to jail, Nothing happens, uh, which you know happens a reasonable amount of time. Um, you know, th what do you do with the, with the donor then? And, and then from, uh, I guess, uh, for, for Ernest and Frida, are, you, are you thinking about impact? And if, and if a story comes out and nothing happens, you know, where do you go? And then, of course, you've also got donors you need to go back and, and talk to. So do you want to talk a little bit about impact? So impact is, is tricky. I know that um, a lot of my clients, particularly you know, content producers, folks doing editorial work, um, get really skittish when you know we're writing the proposal and the time comes to answer the question about the you know the kind of impact we expect this project to have. Because you never know, right? I mean, you can spend a ton of time and put a ton of resources into a project, and maybe you know maybe you publish on the same day that there are you know two mega storms you know hitting United States population centers, <laughs> and it just goes nowhere. Um, so I think. The first part in is preparing to measure impact. I think that's something that really helps a funder. It goes along with Brigitte's comments about work plans. Just the fact that you are attuned to what you think this project has the possibility to do and how you're going to know if that's succeeding or failing um, helps a funder understand kind of how you think, helps them see that you are a planner and that you're proactively thinking about how you're going to get this project out. Um, you're going to help people engage with it. You're going to make sure that it reaches, you know, thought leaders and influencers. Influencers. So one of the things that I think you can point to in the, in the case of, you know, sort of, sort of a story that publishes and goes nowhere is, you know, did you do a little bit of an outreach campaign and make sure that you sent it to the relevant public agencies or advocacy organizations that might have some interest in it? So, you know, maybe it doesn't blow up like the Panama Papers, but you've gotten it in front of some, you know, critically important constituencies that are poised to understand it and maybe do something with it. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is, particularly in this business, impact is kind of a long tail proposition. Um, you know, it's not necessarily going to be the case that you pub on Sunday and on Wednesday legislation changes. Um, you know, that happened with the Panama Papers, right? You know, they pubbed and then the Icelandic Prime Minister resigned. Um, pretty cool victory, certainly helpful for fundraising purposes, um, <laughs> but we can't count on those kinds of outcomes. So. The other thing that I think you want to commit to, and this goes back to the kind of point of, I would make about persistence. Um, part of your jobs is really just to build relationships with your donors so that you know, a story that falls flat is seen as a one-off and not necessarily something that you know, they, they've, because you've stayed in touch with them about other stories that have been successful, when one kind of you know, goes bust, it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to have a conversation with that funder about what else you might need to support more effective audience engagement or outreach um, to make those stories more effective in the future. Um, so I think part of it is, is also, and, and the other part is, you know, you monitor where that story goes over time. Maybe it doesn't make a difference today, but six months down the road, somebody else picks it up and does a follow-up story on it, and that's your victory too. Um, and you need to make sure that you circle back to the funders that supported that and, and make sure they know about it. So I think part of it is, you know, on the, on the front, you know, front end, planning to track impact and thinking about what you want it to look like ideally, and on the back end, continuing to monitor it, uh, communicate with your donors about it, um, and you know, use it as a relationship building tool. Yeah, the impact uh, is uh, just like uh, my colleague has said, is uh, 
Yeah, it's an issue that uh, normally we need to discuss even with the funders or the donors. But uh, I think the most important thing is that uh, these two sides, I mean, donees and donors, um, they need to, to, to agree because you can't enforce like every story must create an impact. So the only thing I normally appreciate is that uh, if we are funding hundreds of stories, you should not be expecting like every story to create impact. But at least we agree like um, 10 or 20 percent of it. And it is basically focusing on some case studies that may happen, affecting or changing and improving people's life. Then we can communicate with the donors that this is what is happening. But not necessarily that uh, every story would create impact. Because based on our own experience in Tanzania, we have seen some of the very simple stories that bring a, a, a big impact, but sometimes you can even uh, have a conflict between quality story, in-depth reported story, but there is no impact. But a uh, very simple story, you can just be surprised that there is impact. I remember in one of the cases, we supported a journalist who went to investigate, um, um, I think it was all about uh, many farmers were not receiving their, their fertilizers. We have a system in Tanzania, farmers need to receive fertilizers subsidies by the government, but they never received. And the journalist reported the only single story, and it was in a, in a, in a, in a government newspaper. And the member of parliament took that newspaper, and he was referring to it in the parliament, asking the prime minister in the parliament what the government is going to do about this story that has been reported in the government newspaper. And the prime minister acted immediately like, so we are going to send the police, they will be arrested, we will do this and that, but it was only a single story. But if you compare, you might have a series of stories, 12 of them, with a lot of risk behind, and there is no impact. So this is just something that we need to strike a balance and agree between donors and, and, and the donors. I completely agree, yes. I would like to start with another example. I'm a journalist, I like cases. Uh, back in 2003, I was traveling Hungary, uh, which was in the years when a lot of formerly state-owned companies were privatized, so there was a sort of robber economy, uh, very aggressive uh, privatization and a lot of uh, corruption. And there was a lady I interviewed and she had unveiled massive corruption in one privatization case of, of a public company, huge public company, um, and there was no reaction whatsoever at all. And I, had, I came traveling from, from Western Europe and there was a cinema movie at the time about an Irish investigative journalist and she was like depicted like a hero. And so this Hungarian lady said, wow, in the West you glorify your investigative journalists. And here just nothing happens. And then she paused for a little moment and she said, well, okay, but in other countries they kill them. So probably, <laughs> so the, the, the measuring, the immediate measuring of impact of journalism is a terribly tricky thing. And I think if I may step a little bit back and take sort of the meter level, in the field of nonprofit journalism, we, at least in Europe, I mean, the U.S. is further ahead, but in Europe, we're only starting to work with that. And I really believe that we, journalists and donors, need to develop a balance, as you mentioned, a balance of credibility, because what is the shared interest of journalists and donors? It is to create credible journalism, which then can go its way through society. How we document that is, is a tricky question. So if we find a models that create, allow this balance of impact, that's the task in my view. Um, the donors have a, the, the need to document, to, to work along their statutes and to document to their trustees or whoever. And journalists have a need to stay editorially independent and to research stories where maybe no reactions. Well, there was a reaction, the Hungarian lady never got a job again. Not the reaction you want. Not the and reaction you want. But so, so, so the, I think we should really, uh, the, 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 um, currently donors often demand the, the documentation of impact and have 
you know, the, the current balance is we have to find that. But we, I, 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 I'm happy about this discussion because there is a shared interest in credibility and we need to find a balance that really allows genuine editorial independence. And I think what, what Ernest said really struck me because I, I think sometimes what, you know, what ties people in knots about the impact question is this idea that it needs to be something you know, huge and global. And I, you know, I know I've talked to a lot of people here who are one-person shops or five-person shops. Um, and you, know, you don't need to win the Pulitzer. Like, I think even if a story pubs and really goes nowhere, the fact that you told a story that nobody else did is an impact. And I think that we as fundraisers you know, kind of have a job to do to, to educate donors about what impact looks like. And sometimes it's just telling that story that doesn't get told otherwise. Like, even if it's one story about one tiny community, that makes a difference. It was yesterday in, an, in a related panel, there was a lady from an African foundation, and unfortunately I didn't get the name. She said, merely the asking of questions yes. is sometime a value in it by itself, and there will be no impact whatsoever. Yeah. And maybe just in addition to, I mean, maybe you also need to understand that we need to be tracking, because grant giving, supporting investigations, uh, has a cycle, so you can start. You, can, you can't work on a story like more than six months, for example. Okay, you can have a series of stories even in a year, but uh, finally, it is, it is a cycle that comes to an end, and it is a project which comes to an end. But uh, we have some cases where you do a story today and you see the impact after five years, and uh, we have those kind of cases. For example, in Tanzania, you might have heard about. Uh, uh, the, the, the current uh, president in Tanzania, Magufuri, Joseph Magufuri, who has been tracking some of the corruption that were not uh, tracked many years ago. Because sometimes impact can happen depending on the political working environment, even the political will. So there are some corrupt cases that uh, were funded by my organization, but there was no any action that was taken by that time, the, 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 the regime at that time never took initiative to act on those kind of corrupt, corrupt cases. But after five years, now with a new regime, maybe you can say with a political will. So some actions have been tracked down and action has been taken. After five years. So this is one of the elements that we also need to be telling the donors that we should not be talking about impact as of now, but the impact can also happen, depending on the political working environment. I think, I think there's kind of two things I'd add to that, too. So one, um, there was a wonderful report um, uh, that Columbia University did where they identified watchdog journalism and scarecrow journalism. And watchdog journalism obviously catches people who are doing bad things and exposes them. Scarecrow journalism, by the fact that you cover the school board every day or you cover them every day, deters people from doing bad things. And I think there's a, there's a case you can make to say, Exactly, the just asking the questions every day, just making the FOIA request can stop things already, and that might be an argument. The other, the other argument I would make, which I've been making a lot now uh, lately, is, you know, um, um, uh, uh, God, what is his name? Dr. Huxtable. Um, Bill Cosby, right? 38 cases, no real big impact. Bill O'Reilly, no real big impact. Um, um, Roger Ailes, no real big impact, and then, you know, Harvey Weinstein, who's kind of famous, but not really a household name, and boom, the world explodes, right? So, you're building up. Mm -hmm. um, let, me, let, me, let me switch a little bit and, and talk uh, or ask about uh, sort of two things. One, related, not related, you know, you answer whichever way you want. Uh, one is the, the notion, the, the idea of core funding, the vexed idea of, you know, we'll pay for you to keep the lights on, versus I want you to cover a story or I need like a big project that has to be interesting and how, how uh, grantees try to, should, you know, what are the strategies for balancing that out? Because obviously you want the money or a project you want to do, but you also want to keep the lights on and pay the, you know, the, the, all the bills. And then the, the other question of how you navigate through, um, you know, donors want you to cover, you know, whatever, women's rights in this or they want you to cover migration in that and, you know, I only want to cover X. How do, you, how do you make that dance between what donors really want in a specific area and, you know, versus what you want to do? Anybody? Okay, maybe um, I can uh, go with the last question that um, 
I mean, the uh, donor's influence on uh, the type of stories to cover. I think this should start from when you think strategically. So from your strategic point of view, then you agree, this is our strategy. So otherwise, those kind of semantic areas, they should have been discussed and agreed right from the beginning. So in my case, with the organization that I'm leading, so we have that, uh, I mean, high level, uh, strategic level, and expectations that we have read all, all agreed. And we don't focus on some specific stories that we need to, to cover. After all, uh, I think we have just tried to push back right from the beginning, from the design point of view. And for me, that's the best way to avoid this kind of influences. But of course, it doesn't mean that I don't know if I'm supported by a certain donor. I know that to alter their area of interest. So, for example, the approach we use at Tanzania Media Foundation is that it is the responsibility of the individual journalists to pitch the stories. What we do basically is to, to guide them that uh, at the end of the day, at a high level, we want to see more of good governance, transparency, and accountability stories. But how do you have those trigger points to influence the good governance, accountability, and transparency? Those are the areas that we need to be telling the applicants, and that's what we do. And from there, it, 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 it doesn't matter what type of story, be it immigration, be it environment, be it agriculture, and if, even if maybe to cover the donor's interest, or it doesn't cover, as long as you have agreed at that, at that high level. That is my view. We have had similar considerations at Journalism Fund, and again, this is, uh, is a, it goes over and over again. We, when we hand out uh, work grants for journalists, uh, we have for Flanders, it's in-depth, and investigative journalism in Flanders or of relevance for Flanders. When we do it on European level, we have the additional requirement that it should be investigative journalism in Europe in cross-border teams. So we want to stimulate the method of cross-border journalism, which is so important for, for Europe uh, and the world, but we are active in Europe. So, so these are not connected to topics. So we don't want to set the agenda. We just want to stimulate journalists, allow journalists to develop this new method in Europe. Um, we have had some pretty severe fights within our board because the board says we are not agenda setting. And there is sometimes the opportunity to get indeed money for one topic or the other where we would go beyond the usual suspects of our, of our donor partners whom we have been working with for years, who support journalism, etc. Um, so we could get extra money for journalism if we go to a foundation supporting the climate or supporting migration or, or, or coverage of migration or these kind of questions. And we have then decided that indeed we can offer by topic grants. It's voluntary whether you apply or not. We will strive to have several of them, so not just one, but several topics so that people can select. And then journalists can apply or they can not apply. And uh, Europe being a very diverse part of the world, also when it comes to journalism ethics and when it comes to whom to take money from and whom not to take money from, we have to respect the, uh, or we do respect and, and we trust the journalists to apply the professional ethical consideration before they apply for a grant or not. Because if we, offer grants with strings attached, say, a topic, then, as a journalist, you have to clarify that according to your ethics, with your editor, etc. So we, we, we will ho try to offer that, but we will not, uh, and leave it to the professional judgment of, of the applicants. I think it's, you know, it's a question of preparation. It's one of the considerations that you need to give some real thought to, you know, in the early stages of your fundraising efforts, of your organizational development efforts, and probably continually as you move along. You know, you need to, it's, it's probably worth, you know, sitting down with your board, your stakeholders, and thinking about what kind of a gifts acceptance policy looks like. What are the conditions under which you would have to turn down money? Um, and what are, you know, on, on the other side of that, what are the, you know, the best types of revenue to support the kind of work you want to do? If you are, you know, a nonprofit looking to focus specifically on covering climate and energy issues, then you don't really have a problem taking restricted funding or, you know, kind of semi-restricted funding to cover those issues broadly. Um, on the other hand, you know, if your beat is 
breaking news or sort of multi-purpose investigative, then you might need, you know, you might just need really flexible funding. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of donors are getting a bit better about providing core support or unrestricted support than they used to be, um, but it's still, you know, an uphill battle. Um, and I think, again, that, you know, this is, this is also where the relationship building point comes in, um, where sometimes a donor might really need to give you a project-specific grant um, as, you know, what I kind of think of as a training wheels grant, right? They, you know, they want something very discreet, very specific from you um, so that they can get to know you and understand your capabilities. And then you have the, the opportunity to have the conversation with them about, you know, why this really should be general support in order to be more effective. Um, so I think, you know, part of this is just, you know, a cultivation pathway of the donors you're working with. Um, but, you know, on the, on the front end, just be really cognizant that sometimes people can put some really restrictive conditions on grants. Um, and you need to be, to under, you know, to think about what you are comfortable with and uncomfortable with um, and be able to, you know, to kind of say that to a donor and have a conversation. Yeah, that would be the second question you asked, which I didn't answer. And I think from the side of the journalism community, be that as an organization or be that as a small investigative outlet or so, the need for core funding is uh, of all over the place, of course, and it's difficult to obtain, as you said. I think when, if we should send a message from, from the practitioners here to donors is uh, combine these kind of thinkings. I mean, if you invest in core funding for an organization or for a small uh, investigative journalism outlet, you have a perspective to the future. If you think in perspectives to the future, then you also think impact. It's just a different way of approaching, of investing in potential impact. Because the, the time question, uh, you, you mentioned sometimes that, that the surrounding, and that was also in the discussion yesterday, the surroundings of a story that is published need to be fertile ground for any reaction to, to really grow. Um, so so the, the, the time question for, for asking for impact is really a, a, a notion we should consider in, in our work as journalists, and we do that. Uh, when we talk about, we follow up our story of last year, this is a time question, a timeline question. And, and I think that would be something that we should ask our donors, think in the future perspective, think in the timelines. So a lot of what we've been talking about have been um, sort of big institutional donors, which you're very used to, but there's a, a world changing where there's a lot of individuals now, especially you know, in the world of Trump, who say, I wanna pay for, I wanna do something, I wanna give some money, and they're not always giving to a, an established organization, so they, they, they're giving out their money on their own, so they don't have policies. Um, and at the same time, on the flip side of that too, not only are uh, organizations going out getting money, there are a lot more individual journalists going out. So how do we negotiate the more sort of individual, less, structured, less organized um, kind of, I know you've been thinking about this. Well, on the whole, I think this development is really healthy. Um, you know, we've, we've I, I, I think we're sort of just at the, you know, kind of steep end of more donors getting interested in supporting journalism and media efforts. Um, and in the States, at least, it's been a really exciting year. Um, so I, th I think that, I mean, you know, again, it's part of our mandate as fundraisers just to, to try to educate our donors in terms of what, you know, what we really need, what the sector really needs. Um, and sometimes, you know, somebody who's not an established funder of journalism or media, you know, isn't a, a, a program officer at a foundation who used to be a practicing journalist so knows what it's like, you know, sitting in a newsroom. Um, you just have to have that conversation about, you know, what, if your ultimate goal is to increase, you know, the quantity and quality of coverage in general or on a particular issue, what we really need and what you need for us to have an impact is editorial independence. So we need to be really clear about what this relationship is and what it isn't. Um, and, you know, you, you might need to have that conversation, you know, I guess a more intense conversation with a donor um, that's, you know, a new philanthropist or that's new to funding journalism and hasn't really thought through the mechanics of this before. Because it's certainly happened to clients of mine in the last year where, you know, a nice family foundation pops out of the woodwork and wants a super specific set of stories by a specific freelancer. <laughs> and, you know, we just have to say that's, that's just not how we work. But but 
if you're interested in this issue, here's how we could help you. Um, and it took a couple of conversations to get them to come around, and they've been incredibly high maintenance. Um, <laughs> they're on the steep end of the learning curve. Um, but that's part of growing the pie, right? Growing you know, the pot of money that's available for this work, which is clearly what we need to do. Yeah, just a point to emphasize on uh, funding individual journalists. Yes, they are less structured and some donors, of course, think that there is more risk on that. But uh, just based on our own experience, to me, uh, it pays better supporting individual journalists than media outlets in terms of value for money. Uh, I can spend one forty thousand dollars just to give grants to one media outlet. But I can spend one four thousand to give to almost one hundred individual journalists by spending maybe two thousand dollars of maximum four thousand dollars to pursue an investigative story. And in terms of impact, I am able to see more impact than the media outlet with that a lot of money. And this is is practical because, for example, I mentioned it during my introduction that um, we do the the urban uh, urban rural bridging the gap. So more than 80% of the grant we give goes to individual journalists. And uh, we have a product which is called a rural dispatch grant. So this involves individual journalists. And we do it 60 journalists per year. We send them to rural areas in batches. And they go remote areas where the media outlet cannot support, cannot fund to work on an, in a remote area story. So we do that. And they will bridge that gap. And it works because it touches the ordinary people's life about education, agriculture, you know, their daily life, they normally improved. Dispensary are being built, hospitals and um, classes and desks are being built just because of simple story by assigning a journalist and commissioning a journalist to go more rural. So to me, this is what actually not only my views, but based on our experience for the last eight years. Uh, I, I, I have the very same experience with uh, supporting individuals. Right? I would like to come back to the questions on how to interact with donors. And I think it's important when we are active with investigative journalists that we think of, the, that we don't forget our own background as investigative journalists and the transparency that we demand it. Um, so I think transparency may be a very good tool in these kind of interactions. So. We are currently talking with some of our donors about inserting or explicitly mentioning the fact that there are no strings attached beside the fact that we give it for European cross-border grants, um, that there are no strings attached and that this is in the contract and that we may quote this passage of the contract publicly. So that we, that we really say, okay, this is written on paper and the contract would end if there was interference just to show it off, so to try to insert some transparency. And we also have had discussions with donor who, donors who were like, okay, no, you can hardly even mention our name. And we say, no, no, but I mean, we have to tell where the money comes from. So, so this kind of working with transparency, and again, I think this is a process where we just probably in the early decade um, of uh, finding a, this balance of credibility and, and, and find the elements that can support that. So transparency may be, or can be, I, I, we, we experience implementing with transparency models on well, how One of the things we talked about yesterday was the, this um, model um, uh, policy that INN has put up for organizations that they can, you know, that they can show people what, they, what their things is. And one of the things we talked about is individuals could even yeah. put this up and you know, stick it on their website and say, these are the policies I follow, and this is the money that I will take. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions, but before I do that, I just want to get one really quick question out to all of you, which is, tell me one or two things you, you wish grantees would not do. Should. <laughs> Should not Should do. Should not do. What are the one or two things that you hate <laughs> grantees doing and you wish if you could have a chance to change everything, they would never do it again? Um blow proposal and report deadlines. <laughs> just, you know, they're usually publicly available. You usually have plenty of heads up. Just do the work, put it on a calendar, get it in on time. I know journal, individual journalists are not trained 
uh, good proposal writers and, and um, they should not hate uh, pitching stories and because some of the individuals they hate because they know ah so pitching i mean writing a proposal is something that i'm, I'm not trained for so i'm trained to write stories so i think they should uh, 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 be aware that uh, pitching a story is just like writing a proposal so this is what uh, i will encourage individual journalists uh, uh, to ensure that uh, yeah, they comply in terms of the approach should be pitching story just like the way they pitch to their editors. Uh, at Journalism Fund, we offer advice to applicants before the application and because we have a peer review jury, we can give even editorial advice. And what I would hope applicants do is read the criteria before they call. On the other hand, some of these conversations where some of the first, in the, within the first five minutes we determined this is not viable for our grant, but then we had conversations on where else they could go, what else they could do with a fabulous idea, and we could bring them into the network that we have of journalists, and so very often there's added value, but still, please read the criteria. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, I think this is an exciting uh, session. My name is Idris, I'm from Nigeria. Uh, what is my area of interest is development communication and I operate in a rural community take, uh, uh, making the government at state level accountable. And in Nigeria, outside the constitution, budget is the most important document. And in tracking that kind of stories, it is key for us to make follow where government, both state and federal, make bogus budget provisions and they are never implemented. As funders or supporting journalists working in this particular area, do you have specific provision for this kind of a things? And I'm happy for the Tanzania that are assisting journalists working in the rural communities because a lot is happening at grassroots that are not known, but people based on those who are residing at, this, at the national headquarters. I think there must be need to support individuals who are interested in working at the rural community and bringing the information down there, holding government accountable using the development story because these are very key issues. Billions have been wasted, corruptions have been known, and it is like a ritual where government uh, make budgetary allocations in billions and they never execute it. And in the preceding years, you see documents showing we have done this. There is a need to track this particular aspect. Properties, roads, infrastructures that claim to have been budgeted for or to have been executed that are never done. Do you have such a thing in your own platform to support individuals working in this area? Uh, yeah, well, of course, yes, and uh, I appreciate for your uh, um, comments on the, I mean, the support that we focus on the rural areas. And uh, yes, we have the, we have, we, we have been supporting the development uh, issues, and uh, we actually, one of the product product that we have is fellowship program, where we, I mean, journalists apply for fellowship to be attached with us for almost six months. And one of the areas, for example, last year was on development uh, uh, journalism. So these are areas that we also track, for example, issues of SDG. In the past, it was MDG. So this is like exposing the journalists to understand what SDG means on some particular areas, also connected to, to our country, because these countries worldwide, they picked their areas of interest on SDG. So for us, SDG was an entry point to cover or to build capacity of individual journalists on covering development issues. And of course, they stayed with us for a period of six months. And this is an area where we, we actually, um, uh, you know, there is also this challenge of lack of specialization. So most of our journalists, because we are trained, some of them, so, so some of us may be at diploma level or degree level, but we are, we are trained generally, not in a specialization manner. So Tanzania Media Foundation has this particular product which aim to specialize. And we have been specializing on different issues, not only the one that I'm talking about development uh, journalism, but also some particular issues, for example, agricultural journalism, oil and gas, reporting on oil and gas or executive industries, uh, and, and, and the other sectors. So these are the areas that we normally, I mean, see the improvement of our fellow, fellows once they are touched with us for a period of six months. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Winnie Kamau and I'm with the Association of Freelance Journalists and uh, we have an outfit called Talk Africa. It's an online platform where we send our stories and mostly we base on development stories and data-driven stories. So my question is, I'm just learning. Um, for us, we've been struggling with the fact that uh, most of our members are freelancers and uh, they contribute to a platform and as well as contribute to other places so that they can be able to sustain themselves. Um, how do we create a business-minded kind of journalist uh, heart? Because that's where we are struggling with. We are very good at writing stories and getting stories out. But in terms of a business model in, in order to um, monetize, we are struggling at that. And then secondly is about the journalism funds. Um, I'm finding Africa had a fund, a media fund, and I don't know, it somehow collapsed or somehow it went quiet. Nothing is being done much on that. But when it comes to journalism, of, uh, uh, European Union, there's a lot of funding for journalists to go outside Africa, I mean, outside, outside Europe to Africa and come and do stories. Uh, is there a way you can create a model where you can be able to partner with Africans and the Europeans, so that you don't import parachute journalists from Europe to Africa, yet we have journalists who can do some work and you can collaborate together. That sounded like a question to Journalism Fund and we're working on it. And I, I'm happy you mentioned this, this parachute uh, journalist because that would be sometimes necessary but sometimes not suitable for in-depth stories because if you come in for sh a short notice and in short term, you don't get the knowledge of the place. We have had uh, two pilot projects with work grants, uh, cross-border journalism work grants, Europe, Africa. Um, they were pilots, one year only, uh, and we're currently in the course of fundraising. If you keep fingers crossed, as of February, there will be some news. But I can't say anything before that because there are several applicants and all that. Hi, uh, my name is Zoltan Shiposh, I'm from Romania, uh, and I am a, a journalist, respectively, I am a manager of a small investigative newsroom, uh, and I do write quite a lot of uh, uh, applications as a journalist and as an organization as well. And um, I want to ask you, what do you think, uh, how can I ask for feedback from donors? Uh, because many times I work quite a lot on uh, uh, one uh, uh, application, it gets rejected, which is okay. Uh, however, uh, they never um, uh, say why was that uh, uh, rejected. Have you tried to ask? Sorry? Have you tried to yeah. ask? Yeah. And um, received uh, basically no answer. So uh, how, how can I ask more effectively? Um, so one piece of advice I would say is, is just persist in asking. Um, sometimes if you get declined and you, f you, know, you follow up right away and ask for feedback, that program officer is maybe you know, going into docket prep for a board meeting um, and is otherwise you know, just crazy busy. So if you don't hear back, you know, I would say give it, you know, give it three or four weeks, follow up and ask again. Um, it's also not a bad idea, you know, Brigitte was saying that, you know, they'll hop on the phone with you before you submit an application. Um, even at some foundations that don't publicize that as their policy, a lot of times if you reach out to a program officer well in advance of a deadline and sort of pitch them your, on your idea, maybe send them a couple of paragraphs or a short concept note, you can get some feedback before you actually write the application. Um, I actually advise my clients never to submit a full application to an open call. I think that's just like spending 10 hours on, you know, document and throwing it in the trash can. Um, just don't do it. <laughs> um, so, so I would say that, you know, this is, it's part of the kind of preparation and relationship building phase. Um, know, you know, if you're going to put a proposal together, if you're going to put the time into doing it, know who is going to be reading it and who is their ultimate audience. What do they need to do with it? So I would try to do more of that work on the front end. Um, but definitely, you know, if you've submitted a proposal and you, you, you know, you just get the rejection letter without any feedback, just persist, you know, give it a couple months and try to sit down and have a conversation with, um, with whomever's reading it. 
Maybe if, before we. Oh, sorry. Go on. Go on. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that feedback is very critical and it's very important. And uh, experience always is the best teacher. I can just share our experiences. You know, there is allegations sometimes if you don't give feedback that um, some people, they almost, almost repeat getting grants. And uh, you may be accused of uh, favoritism, etc. But uh, the best way is to give feedback. And for us, how it has worked out is that we use the alumni, the ones that who received the grants before, then we do outreach, and then they will be the ones, they will be our ambassadors to tell the rest, how did you manage to get grants? So they will be sharing the criteria, and if there is someone got grants two or three, four times, it will be sharing, it's like at a peer level, before even we endorse what eh, has shared. And the moment we get someone who applied, say, four or five times without getting any grant, we also use him or her as an example to tell other stories, giving feedback, that I struggled the first time I missed. And this, were the, this is how my first proposal was all about. I missed it second time, third time, but finally I got it. And this is how I wrote the proposal. So I just want to emphasize, giving feedback also give us funders put us in a better position. Two, point, two points. Uh, at Journalism Fund, we, because we want to stimulate a method, we always give feedback. We have the jury and the secretar secretary or the coordinator of the jury takes notes and gives feedbacks to the applicants. And the, the, the quality uh, measurement is that when we have applicants writing back, damn, I would have loved to have the money, but thank you very much. This feedback was so constructive. I'm on the move again. That was the one thing. And the other is we talked about the importance of asking questions. And since you're from Europe and since you may welcome to the European Investigative Journalism Conference in May, I would play the ball back and say, let's up set up a panel. Because we will have donors there. Let's set up the panel and explicitly ask the question about improving the quality of applications, uh, targeting quality ap uh, applications, etc because that's a shared interest of donors and applicants, so not to waste the time. And I'll be back to you on that. One action point, I'll do this whole thing over here. My name is Annie Mulia, I'm from Indonesia, Jaring. It's the only investigative journalism center in Indonesia. I have two questions, I'll try to be short. First about impact. We know that impact is not happening instantly, and also we understand that we're not working alone in field. For example, if there is one, uh, my organization has given a fellowship to a journalist who uncover a corruption of a leader in a, in a local area who is running for the election. Uh, it was the, uh, and then it was published. And when the election happened, uh, the leader did not win the election. He was an incumbent. Um, well, we don't have any survey on how the reports was influencing the voters. Um, how can we say it to the donors that is that an impact or because we don't want to be over claim, of course, but uh, maybe if you, how do you think as donors about this fact and how should we uh, report it? How should we bring this fact to donors because we don't want to be over claim once again. And the second, in my country, um, the NGOs, including ours as um, um, non-profit journalism, is discussing now about how struggling it is to get donors' money. Um, we, if I remember, there is a research from Boston Consulting Group uh, telling us where the money of the worlds are. I remember that the money from donors is little tiny dots on the right side, <laughs> together with the CSR money, and then the big, big one bullet is from business side, of course, on the left-hand side. And for example, in my country, a big uh, uh, CSO, and uh, it's also part of the world CSO, like Transparency International Indonesia, also is struggling to get donors. And we are talking about now, uh, among our NGOs uh, society, we are talking about social entrepreneurship. How the donors think about this? If, for example, my organization are asking um, proposal or asking budget uh, for us to, you know, like having small steps that we can 
um, monetize or we can do something more, doing our service more to, for our sustainability uh, as an organization. How would you think as donors about those ideas? Thank you. Probably to you, Bridgeta. So on the impact question, um, I, you know, I think you absolutely claim credit for, you know, kind of informing voters' behaviors. Social change is a really complex process, and you know, the reason funders invest in journalism is because they appreciate that it is part of this fabric of social change. Uh, so I think, you know, it is. It's absolutely your right and your responsibility to um, to claim credit for uh, you know for for influencing behavior for you know in, informing public discussion. Uh, I sort of tell my clients you know fake it till you make it. Um, it's 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 a really complex process and you know there are many factors that contribute to social change, but yours is definitely one of them. And you know nobody can disprove that you didn't have an impact, right? Um, on the, you know, I guess on the kind of sustainability and, and sources side, I mean, you know, the, the, the encouraging thing is that, you know, charitable giving continues to increase. It's been, you know, it's been recession proof, um, you know, for, for the last 20 years. Um, you know, it's, it's grown substantially in the United States. Um, but in terms of thinking about donor universes, um, you know, it's easy to kind of skew toward foundations. We talk a lot about them because they're transparent, they're very public, they give lots of money. Um, you know, the, the biggest charitable giving class in the United States last year, and every year actually, is individuals. And last year, individual giving in the states alone grew by $10 billion. Um, so I think that in terms of thinking about different you know, donor universes, different sources of support. Um, you know, it's important, I think, as a rule to have a sort of balanced portfolio. Um, you know, grassroots donors, major gift donors, foundations, um, you know, maybe some, if you're a training or capacity building organization or you're an, you know, an events driven organization, there are opportunities for corporate support. Um, but I think, you know, everybody has to have a really well thought out strategy for bringing individual giving along because that's ultimately where most of the giving is done. Hi, I'm Wayne Sharp. I work with uh, Internews in Ukraine, so I'm a fundraiser. And uh, my question is, I'd like to know if, um, what techniques you use to uh, prepare donors uh, for, so that they know exactly what they're getting into when they fund investigative journalism. Um, I raised funds from the Canadian government to support a group of investigative journalists in Ukraine. Uh, and for the past three years, it's been mostly great, except when these journalists investigate the president of Ukraine. And whenever they do that, which they did as part of the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers projects, I get called into the embassy and basically I'm told that, um, you know, we have a problem. Um, it, partially it was because the people who approved the project moved on and replaced by other people who maybe did not have the same commitment to freedom of expression. But I guess I'm curious, have you come across, do you come across this at all uh, in your work? And uh, do you have some ways of actually preparing donors so that they know that once you set journalists free, uh, they're going to do what they do? Thanks. Okay, uh, again, based on our own experience, uh, yeah, donors and development partners are always scared on supporting investigative journalism because they know there is a lot of political risks. They want to maintain their diplomatic missions and they don't want to be accused by the, the, the government, etc. But uh, in my own experience, because in my introduction, again, I mentioned about some of us have been interrogated by the policy, just like you were saying, you invited to the embassy to be asked. For me, my case, it's not only invited by the ambassadors to talk about some issues, but even interrogated by the policy for, for maybe a, a full day, just because why did you support that? So what, I, what and how do I prepare the donors or the development partners is just to tell them, you are new to this country, I'm the citizen, so don't bother, don't be very much concerned with the politics, the government, I will take care on your behalf. So I have to play now the cards. Like I know the politics in my country, 
I know the ruling party, how it behaves, and I know the government. And so I have to know some people. So and have to have argument which uh, actually uh, it can uh, save my donors. For example, in one of the cases I mentioned, like you police, you are interrogating me, but don't you remember one day we supported your story and the journalists investigated where weapons were being, I mean, uh, some uh, attackers, good, bad people, I mean, stolen weapons, and they, they were hidden somewhere. But because of the investigation we did, you were able to go and, and, and recover the weapons. So why are you not asking about us supporting such a story? And then you mentioned some other cases, like how about that case? How about that case? How about case? So and then at the end of the day, after those kind of discussions, you end up like, okay, actually, you are doing a good, a good job. So you do the same argument with your government. Be it minister, I remember at one time, I had to do my public relations by inviting the minister. Asking, okay, now let us share the stories that we have been covering here. So these are the stories. The government is there to ensure uh, public and um, good public services, water, health, education, etc. And this is what is happening because of the stories that we have covered, we, we, the stories that we have supported. So these are the stories. So are we wrong doing that? And this is a case you are making with the Minister of Information. So by doing that, you are protecting your development partners and they will continue supporting you uh, behind the curtain. Hi, thank you. My name is Nadine Gerard. I work for Deutsche Welle Academy. And, and I have more of a comment because we've done some research into investigative media outlets in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and we looked at media viability. So not just the, the sustainability, the financial sustainability. So my, con my, my comment would be, I, from the research that we've done and what we've seen, is it's more than just keeping the lights on. I think it's really looking at where do we need to invest um, to make our media viable. Um, so we can react to changing trends, to another financial crisis, to another digital revolution. We don't know what's going to come. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's just my comment. We've developed a model to look at different areas. Um, mine's a really quick answer. I just want to figure. Um, it's what is an acceptable level, um, percentage-wise, to ask for core funding from project funding. So when you're asking for project funding, what is an acceptable level that you can add to help you keep the lights on? Uh, I'm Musab Baba from uh, Ion Network in Sudan. Uh, when we're working with authoritarian, repressive regimes, you know, media blackouts, stuff like that, um, the question of impact. Uh, is reporting and doing uh, more investigative reports on underreported areas, is that considered in its own impact or what, what kind of criteria? I know we've, you know we've talked about this before, but what are the criteria under repressive regimes and trying to uncover in underreported areas? Yeah. Sure, yes, all, all good questions. Um, so to your question, I mean, I, I, yes, I do think that's impact. I think, you know, and again, sometimes impact is a question of what the funder is trying to achieve with the grant. So um, I, it's certainly been a trend in the, you know, kind of American philanthropic community. We're just covering and getting voices from underserved, underrepresented, and hard to reach communities is a value in and of itself. So certainly. Um, but I do think you also want to be attuned to what that does in the community to be able to continue making the case for that kind of investment. On the core funding piece, you know, the sort of, again, this, it varies from funder to funder, but the sort of rule of thumb is, you know, your admin overhead percentage on a project is anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Um, you know, that tends to sort of feel like a comfortable number for, for most donors. Um, but you also need to do, I think, the kind of hard calculation of, like, does that really cover your costs? Um, and, you know, sometimes you might have to ask for something more than that just to be, if, if you know, or if there is a, you know, a capital or a personnel need to implement a project, you know, factor that into your request amount. And just to comment on the comment, um, I think, it, it, yes, absolutely, keeping the lights on is not enough, but I think one of the things that we also fail to recognize often uh, is beyond you know, the stories and keeping the lights on, there's a ton of other things we need to do, digital security, training, you know, lots of other equipment, capital expenses, and so 
you know, having that big, broad view of what, a, what an organization needs over a five-year period is really key. Whether funders will fund it, that's a different, yep, so we'll have to make that case. Anyway, look, uh, thank you very much. There is lunch outside. Never want to get in the way of people in lunch. I want to thank the panel for standing for an hour and 15 minutes. So we all got exercise as well, so thank you very much. Thank you.